Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nashers 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith, and today I'm pleased to introduce exhibition artist Luke Fowler. Luke Fowler is an artist, filmmaker, and musician whose solo exhibitions include Notes Within Vibrations, Spatial Response to the ICA Archive at the ICA London 2010, The Serpentine Gallery London 2009, Warriors, four films by Luke Fowler for X Initiative New York, 2009, Kunsthalle Zurich, 2008, the Yokohama Triennial in 2008 with Toshia Tsunoda, and quite recently, Lismore Castle in Ireland, 2017. He is the recipient of the inaugural Derek Jarman Award, 2008, and has been shortlisted for the Turner Prize in 2012. For his Nasher installation, Fowler has drawn upon the acoustical properties of sculpture to create a multi-channel sound installation. Instead of describing what that means, we think it's best that you experience the artwork for yourselves. So I'm going to ask you all to briefly leave your seats and gather outside in the amphitheater before Fowler begins his conversation with our chief curator, Jed Morse. Before doing so, however, please join me in welcoming artist Luke Fowler.
So I, I take it by your silence that you're either in awe or just completely confounded by that. So, um, you know, if it's one or the other, we'll try and bring you somewhere to the middle by the end of this conversation. Um, it's great to have you all here with us to enjoy the, the public uh, unveiling of this new commission uh, by Luke Fowler. And it's uh, something new for us in a number of ways. Uh, we co-commissioned this work uh, along with our colleagues at Lismore Castle Arts in Lismore, Ireland, and uh, because we were both interested in um, sound sculpture. Um, uh, we were two very uh, different institutions with a love for contemporary art. Lismore Castle Arts is, um, is uh, a, a medieval castle in a, a very um, beautiful rural location in, um, in Ireland. And of course, the Nasher Sculpture Center is a very modern, um, uh, you know, brand new uh, building with a collection of modern and contemporary sculpture. Um, but you know, we thought it would be interesting to um, see if we could find an artist who could deal with um, uh, these two very disparate locations um, and contexts and create a work of art that would somehow combine the two. And so uh, Luke was uh, brave enough to take on, on uh, that, that, ch that challenge. And uh, what we just heard outside is um, one of the uh, manifestations uh, of, of how he dealt with that particular challenge. So um, Luke, I, 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 you know, I'm, want to um, uh, ask you, you know, how did you approach this, this kind of very um, disparate, you know, these very disparate places, disparate contexts, and um, tell us a little bit about the, the, the kind of concept that, that brought you to what we just heard. Yeah, well, thanks, Jed, for having me. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the I kind of thought that there would be a unifying piece, um, a unifying structure that I could then present in both locations, which was the deal with the, with, with the commission. Um, but as I started investigating um, the materials and the acoustics and the site at um, Lismore, um, and started working um, with those with those properties. Um, I started sort of using quite domestic objects, and objects were quite uh, specific to Lismore Castle. So they were like cake tins from the pantry of the kitchen um, that I would bow or or play with a mallet, or they were like. Um, glass crystal vases um, or that I would use to invoke feedback within one of the ice houses um, which were used to, to store food within throughout the the summer um, and um, I also so also used so yeah it was these sort of objects that you, that I used and and had this revelation of when I was sort of sounding these objects around different parts of the castle. Um, in one of the disused rooms um, in a tunnel system that um, uh, joined the, the the servants' quarters um, with the kitchen, um, I found this board which. Um, had a display of, uh, well, had a system of bells that were previously attached to it that were for summoning servants. And so I started using, and I also found a couple of the, the, the bells that were used, and I, so I started using those around the, in the, in the piece um, and around the castle. And, you know, so I was sort of thinking about the symbolic power of these, acoustical objects um, and the resonance for them being really specific to Lismore and perhaps the, you know, the generations of staff that had worked at Lismore. Um, 
I'm just thinking, well, that's not really going to translate over in Dallas in the, the sculpture <laughs> center. Um, so, so I decided to make that its own thing, its own installation, and then approach this perhaps in a similar way when I was, I was telling Jed to, you know, that I would like to use mallets on the sculptures and softly tap them. And he was okay about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, and then um, one of the things I'd, I've always wanted to do, and I'd, I'd been sitting on the shelf in my studio for a very long time, were these drivers or exciters um, that are quite commonly uh, purchased. Um, you know, they're not scientific or uh, esoteric objects at all, um, but they're used for turning surfaces into objects. Um, so quite, uh, sometimes they're marketed as window speakers and they're used in like large department stores where they don't want, um, to, to hang, you know, they don't want, uh, there's some constraint to being able to hang speakers, so they'll turn a surface that is quite radiant into a speaker by attaching this driver with a suction cup to, say, a, a, you know, a wooden surface or, you know, a wooden box, um, podium or, or, a, a, or a large window or something like that. Um, so I'd, I'd had this idea of trying to use these in a work um, and I just never found the time to do it and, and the, the occasion to do it. And so, you know, a couple of basically set myself the task of making this installation um, from scratch whilst I was here. Um, so I came uh, about eight days ago and started these um, investigations into the sculptures and to the uh, the acoustic properties of the sculptures and to, you know, using them as sound objects. Um, and one of the things I tried was to play sine waves through them. And a sine wave is I think, a pure wave, so it's a wave without any harmonics. In it. And it's also a, a wave that's found in nature. Um, so it's found it's, it, it sort of, you know, if you analyze light and, and wind waves, um, and also, in, uh, you know, sonically, we would find that, uh, that that wave occurring in outside of, you know, the electrical impulse of a, of a sine wave generator. So um, I decided to use this uh, function generator it's just basically an iPhone app, but it used to be obviously <laughs> something that would be a sine wave generator. It was a, a, it was a, a box and, um, that, that was used in the past, but now, you know, the convenience of having it on the phone <laughs> far outweighs lugging a box around. <laughs> um, and it does the same thing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's used for... Uh, Acoustical testing is used for you know signal processing. It's used in physics. Um, generally, sine wave generators weren't really used in in music um, because it was considered to be quite dull, <laughs> kind of boring sound. So you wouldn't find them on synthesizers. You wouldn't. Um, I mean, that's a bit of a tangent that I can go into, but you know later. Yeah, we'll talk about electronic music as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> FM synthesis used sine waves, but um, yeah, so I, I, I basically took these, the longest sweep that I could make, which was 10 minutes, and picked certain frequency ranges and chose different sculptures to, to play these slow sweeps, slow glissandi um, sweeps through. And I had no idea what what they would do, you know, I had no idea if it would work or if it wouldn't work, um, if it would be interesting or completely boring. Um, and I, I just recorded it. And it was when I was reviewing the material that really that material just really struck me um, as something I really wanted to work with as, as really exciting. Yeah. Um, the way that it created these ruptures, these distortions, these noises, 
um, that were, you know, um, completely specific to the to the material properties right. of of the um, the sculptures. I was doing it with Jed. Witnessed one when I, I did it with a, the Judd that's on display there um, in the back gallery, which is a long rectangular um, form, and. As it was sweeping through um, the sculpture, it was making these um, a periodic um, noises that were quite harmonic and um, gritty and uh, sort of metallic sounding. Um, I said to, to Jed, oh, what, what do you think that is? And he, he was saying, well, it's, when the green blocks are attached to it, there's brackets. So basically what you're hearing is the vibration of those brackets. I was like, this is great. It's like a material investigation <laughs> of the internal structure of a sculpture yeah. that we aren't privy to with our eyes. Yeah, and you, you experimented with a number of sculptures, you know, both inside and outside in the garden. Um, you know, you, you, you experimented with the Richard Serra sculpture in the garden and um, you know, we even tried some of the, the glass uh, instruments in the, uh, the Tony Cragg sculpture. Yeah, well, when, when uh, I was, because I knew a lot of the sculptures weren't on this, uh, were in a storage and they would need to be called up. So Jed sent me this like catalog of, of the sculptures that, that were in storage. And one of them that I thought might be interesting from an acoustical point of view was the Tony Cragg's um, glass instruments. Yeah. And even the title sort of suggests a kind of musical <laughs> pro property, appropriation of them. Um, and I have done things where I've been like dropping um, contact mics into uh, vases or vessels. And that was one of the things that I, that I did in, in Lismore, um, where you hear the air circulating you know, within this structure and it sometimes produces a tone. Uh, so it was kind of, did that and then, um, yeah, it was, it was okay. It wasn't, you know, incredibly exciting, but um, I was thinking if I was to have done the slow sweep with the transducer, it might have broken the glass. So. <laughs> <laughs> I heard on the side of caution. Yeah. You know. <laughs> we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then, uh, you found two that were particularly resonant. And the, I mean, the interesting thing that, that Luke was describing about this exciter, and it, I, it, I, didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, it, it was used in commercial settings. You know, you could essentially play music through the exciter, and yeah. then the exciter would turn a kind of regular resonant surface into an amplifier, mm -hmm. essentially, into a into speaker. A speaker. Yeah. yeah. And, and so instead of, you know, putting music through it, you were simply putting sine waves mm -hmm. through it. And, uh, and then using the sculptures as the amplifiers well, of speakers. those. Yeah, of, as, as speaker. the speakers for yeah. those, those sounds. Um, Irregular. And, right. Um, partial speakers, you know. Right, because they would, because, they're, because of the structure of the sculpture They're not itself. made to be speakers. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the, but the, the two that seemed to be particularly resonant um, were the, the one Naum Gabo sculpture, um, Head. Yeah, the constructed, constructed head, head, which is upstairs in the in the uh, entrance bay right now, and then the other one was the Barnett Newman Here Three, this kind of stainless steel column, which I'm sure many of you have seen have seen before. Um, and you had experimented with those first downstairs, but then you wanted to to bring them up into into the gallery space, um, and it was I don't know that was that, that was a revelation for me hearing them up there in that space, you know, what, what was, what were you thinking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting them out of storage and, and up into the, the space in the sculpture center? Well, from a pragmatic point of view, there's incredibly, like, noisy lights. Yeah, in down the storage. in storage, yeah. So there was this, like, even when you turned the lights off, there was a safety light and it was kind of buzzing and <laughs> it was annoying the hell out of me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, there was people coming and going. It was like, it's a, you know, it's a working 
uh, environment. So there was the kitchen next door and people talking and stuff like that. So it was, it was really hard to get like a clean recording yeah. of, of the sculptures. Um, so when I had my sort of score in place, I uh, had my master plan, um, I you know, came in, I think it was on Wednesday morning, and I hadn't told Jed that I was gonna use the Gabo that was part of my master plan. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden, like my jaw dropped because uh, the displays team were saying, well, we're just gonna get this Gabo out of here for you. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not <laughs> finished with it yet. <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of, uh, I thought, oh God, you know, how am I going to, how, how am I going to do this now? Like it's it's going to be installed in the gallery. So uh, I broached it with with Jed about the the possibility of actually recording outside of this um, storage space, and thankfully he was he was welcoming to the idea. So we we um, just set a time in the evening when everyone had left the building, and um, yeah, it's. What's, what was really f fascinating about the, the process as it sort of unveils uh, and or um, as it rolls out over the course of the 10 minutes is that you have basically different standing waves that are excited um, or that occur as it moves up the frequency range or down the frequency range. Um, and hits certain um, sympathetic resonant parts of the sculpture that echo um, the frequency of, um, and, and so you, you get these swells of, of uh, harmonics and of, uh, of dynamics um, at different points. And then also at the very, very low frequencies, um, you get uh, this clicking, um, and yeah, at times it sound for me. At times it can sound like you know uh, the multiphonics of a trumpet. Um, it, you know, it can sound like an electric guitar. It sounds you know you hear all all this noise um, and and distortion products that are produced by the the sculpture. That's completely wonderful and. You know, when I make a work, um, a work like this certainly is it's very different from writing a piece of music where, um, you know, everything has to be in key and, you know, you're all in tune with each other and you're, you have parts and you're working them out together or alone. And, um, and it's all, you know, uh, a, a priori sort of, you know, preordained structures, and basically, you're, you know, you're just playing playing them back um, in a concert situation. But this is was really like, you know, I set up this drug, this process and and let it go, and I just didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, in that way, it's I mean, it's it's very similar to, um, you know, certain minimalist strategies, you know, of of limiting the kind of field of possibilities and seeing what kind of expression can be wrought from that very limited field of possibilities, whether it's Saul LeWitt and cubes or Judd and boxes or, you know, Carl Andre and bricks. Um, but even in music, I mean, it, it, remind, it reminded me a little bit of, um, you know, uh, of, you know, Steve Reich um, and it minimal, you know, minimalist composers like that. Um, you know, it's, it, it was, um, um, you know, uh, you know, I know that you're, a, you know, a, an avant, you know, somewhat of a historian of avant-garde music. At least your knowledge of it is far deeper than my own. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to, wondering if, um, you know, how much that experience ha kind of plays out, either intentionally or, or, um, you know, just through happenstance, in in what you were able to derive from the Gabo and the Barnett Newman. Well, I, I suppose there's that, um, you know, Cajun principle definitely of like of, of a process-based work, um, you know, an experimental work in the true sense of, of an experiment that 
you know, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right. And that's why you do it. Yeah. You know. Um, and uh, yeah, the, you know, of course, um, David Tudor, who is one of Cage's long-standing collaborators, um, is definitely a forerunner of somebody that used these drivers in a piece called Rainforest, which has become a sort of genre in itself in audio arts or in sonic arts. You know, um, you know there are many people like um, Sergei Terepin um, who have taken this idea and, and you know, ran with it. And, and um, that's this sort of Tudor idea of, of using objects as speakers. Um, some, and then, you know, there are other people like Alvin Lussier who has, invet, you know, used sine waves um, to invet, investigate acoustic phenomena. Um, and, you know, music for long thin wires is a classic mm -hmm. piece um, that is maybe kind of similar to, has sort of overlaps with, with what I've done here. Yeah. Um, you know, so what, what you all heard outside is essentially, you know, um, a, a document of the material history of the Nasher Sculpture Center. Um, well, it's a dialogue between two sculptures that are in the, yeah. the collection that, uh, yeah, that I chose to transduce. And, and you have them going, one doing, um, ascending in frequency and the other one descending in frequency. Is, um, you know, was, was there, did you have a sense of what would happen when you know, those two frequencies kind of intersect at the same point? I, I had an idea, yeah. that, like, <laughs> yeah. a clue that, yeah. um, that, that you would get phase beatings. Right. Uh, and, 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 um, so could, can you tell that point when you're in the, in the space? But it's also completely contingent on whether the sculptures are um, resonating at the points of sure. uh, beatings. Right, because um, you run them through different ranges of frequencies. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they're both going through the same range at the same time. Right. Um, one's inverted. So if you were to have done that in a sort of anechoic chamber, you'd get a lot more beating um, right. than, than you do here. But um, what happens is that those acoustic effects are periodic based on the, the properties of the sculpture. And right. they're also accentuated by the setting, right. you know, the auditorium setting. Right, yeah, because the sound is reverberating off the stone. Yeah, it's bouncing off those walls. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you have it set up in a very particular way, the speakers, so that, so that it literally is a conversation. Can you yeah. explain, explain that yeah, a little bit? Um, when I did the <clears throat> the Lismore piece, you know, I, I was maybe using like a bit more acoustic uh, electronic processing, and um, you know DSP, and you know, kind of tried that a bit like with this some um, sort of spatial spatializing software, um, but it was completely redundant because right. really, you know, it's the space and the frequencies of the space um, that, that provided the, all of the effects that I needed, you know. Um, so... Because it's a big kind of echoey castle space. I mean... It's, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, here I'm talking about now. Oh, okay. um, they actually, the, in contrast to the Lismore space, the Lismore space is really just like a small um, stone dome okay. um, that was really quite close and didn't have really much reflection or echo. Oh, where you, where you placed the speakers to... Yeah. 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 Um, but, but here, basically, I, I have one set of speakers voicing one sculpture. So the ones that are in the garden or closer to the garden or the gabo, and then the ones closer to uh, the auditorium are the, the Newman. Right. And then, and then there's this sort of dialogue between them. So that's why I kind of invite people to, you know, the, well, the, 
the piece invites people to to walk around the space and to yeah really uh, and investigate how it sounds at different points in the auditorium and outside the auditorium and um, I really liked when I the first time I did it you know I noticed that the the behavior of the grackles mm -hmm. was <laughs> kind of they were a bit pissed off or something <laughs> someone was on their territory and uh, and they couldn't work out who who or what was producing this sound and they were like <laughs> and up and where is this big fuck off bird? <laughs> um, and uh, but you know now and then but the and then there was other times where they seemed to be singing along with the piece um, and you know I, I even like I'm resigned to the aircraft you know like, <laughs> that, that goes overhead because like yeah it somehow the glissandi, the Doppler effects of the, of the aircraft somehow yeah. mirror some of the ascending and descending tones. Um, so I, when I was thinking about the piece, I was thinking, you know, the great thing, the beautiful thing about sine waves and, and about having this liminal sound is, is that it really becomes a baseline for the the garden, the, you know, the acoustic ecology of the garden and all of the other sounds that are happening around it. And that's why I mean, I wanted to make something that was in harmony with the space. Right. And that wasn't just ignoring the space, you know, the, the, the environment, the acoustic environment of the space, but it was really in harmony with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things is that, you know, because of the way that you've set up the speakers and because of, of the acoustical properties of the, the terraced garden here, you know, it, it, it exists as a sound object. I mean, it has a, a kind of delimited physical presence within that space. There is some bleed, but the bleed out is actually, actually registers more as kind of ambient, um, almost, you know. It, yeah, it could be like the wind or. You yeah, know, or the sound of the, the fountains, yeah. you know, the water in the fountains. And, um, but inside that space, I mean, it has a, I mean, it oftentimes has a, has a very palpable physical presence, uh, which is fascinating. Um, you know, we talk about sound sculpture, and you know, this has been an area of artistic exploration for um, you know, decades, um, but you rarely, and it's something that we wanted to explore as a sculpture uh, institution, um, but it's, it's, it really has kind of um, concretized so effectively uh, within the piece, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, yeah, there was all sorts of, sort of nice coincidences, like um, you know, I didn't choose, I didn't particularly choose the gabo, but um, <clears throat> I said to Jed that um, I recall this morning um, seeing a gabo kinetic mechanical sculpture called Standing Wave in the Tate Gallery, and it's a physical illustration of a standing wave. And that's basically what I've done to the head. Right. You know, I've created standing waves in the head. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think there's all sort, you know, when I think about, or when I, you know, read about some of um, the didactic panels and, you know, the this, the exhibition, you know, the tradition of revolution that the mm -hmm. Jed, the Jed's curated here, and there really is so many overlaps. Even though they're, you know, with the philosophy of what a lot of these sculptors were doing, um, and that's why I think it's it's a shame that you know um, sound isn't more integrated into um, regular exhibitions, but it's sort of ghettoized into this sound art vacuum. Right. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the great sound sculptors, Harry Bertoia, is like almost completely forgotten about outside of the chairs that everyone sits on. Right. Well, um, I'm, I'm working to change that. So. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you brought, brought this, but anyway, I'm, I'm working on a Harry Bertoia retrospective, which will be at the <laughs> Nasher next fall. So we'll, we'll have a chance right. to. To but, learn um, more about Virginia. <laughs> <laughs>
But yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it does seem, it, it's interesting. It's, it's, I think, another example of, um, you know, how, how oftentimes um, non so, so what, what might be considered um, non-traditional works of art or avant-garde uh, media um, are, tend to be ghettoized in the way that, you know, in kind of the grand academic tradition, um, you know, uh, that, that, that media were, were segregated from each other. So you were either trained as a painter or a sculptor or a graphic artist. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, particularly museums and galleries, universities tend to still think of them in that way, even though um, artistic practice has gone beyond that for, you know, over 100 years. You know, artists are pick, choosing mediums that will best uh, suit what they, you know, want to explore or express, right. Right. Um, and so yeah. I mean, I think you know, there you can you can name almost any kind of medium, and and it it, it tends to be ghettoized in in some way. Um, yeah, I think um, I think museums, galleries have a hard time dealing with artists that have different hats that do different things. You know, yeah. uh, Bertoia's sound works were completely ignored. Yeah, um, you know. Even someone like Harry Parch had a really hard time, you know, having his works. You know, how many collections have Harry Parch right. uh, instruments in them? Um, you know, someone like uh, Tony Conrad, um, rest in peace. You know, was went through these vacillations in his life when he was like known as a filmmaker or known as a musician, but never really respected as both. Um, in the same place at the same time, which he should have been. Right, sure. Um, I mean, I think it comes down to some kind of, I don't know, aspect of human nature to kind of need to categorize very cleanly, you know. Um, yeah. No. You know, that's kind of, you know. We the, have a hard time the zoology, the, edges. the zoology yeah. of art, you know. <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, because, you know, the, the sound work is part of a much broader practice of yours. So, you know, you, you are also, um, you know, known as a filmmaker, but I think that some of the things that are going on in the work outside, you see in, in a number of your films. Um, what, and you're also a photographer. Um, one of the, the projects that you did in 2006 that, that struck me as interesting, particularly in relation to this, was is the two-frame films, mm -hmm. um, which is, are essentially a series of, um, they're pairs of photographs. Um, that are taken um, at, it's, um, they're, in, they're location specific, is that correct? And over, uh, at, but at different times. There's a lot of confusion about this. Yeah, series. yeah, yeah, yeah. As but they're evocative. So they're, they're two photographs that yeah. may or may not be visually related by what's in the photograph. Um, but they kind of abstractly suggest a narrative in some way. Is that fair to I, say? Yeah, I mean, people, people just think that they're diptyches. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, that I have, and that's completely missing the point of the photographs. The point um, of the photographs is that they are, they take advantage of an obsolete format, which is the half frame format, which produced 72 photographs on a 36 roll of film. Um, in the portrait format, um, although of course you can turn the camera on its side and use it in its landscape as well, but um, generally it, it, it produced this portrait. And um, what I found when I was, the first time I processed uh, a role in uh, Ghent in, in Belgium, would they sort of apologize to me and they said, look, I'm really sorry, but we don't have the half frame. Um, so we're gonna have to print the two on one in the same, on the same paper. And I said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> and, and then I got it back and I, and I found these beautiful random pairings because I wasn't actually taking a huge amount of photographs. You know, I, I, I would do that thing of, you know, just take one photograph you know, on Tuesday the 12th and then take another one, you know, on the 20th. 
um, in a completely different setting or, you know, the next day or whenever, a month apart or, you know, in a different country. And, and so then what I found was I got these random pairings, um, which quite often there would be a lyrical association between the two. Right. Um, and so that was what I embraced was these, the, ran, the randomness right. of these of these dip tissues. Yeah, that's interesting. And they, you know, because they also, other than suggesting a narrative, also suggest this idea of portraiture, you know, because they are, they're often very disparate images, but um, you associate those two things very clearly because they're, they're placed right next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's kind of, it, 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 trying to puzzle through what, what these things are, you think of, you know, maybe this is abstract portraiture. And so in that, in that way, it kind of, no pun intended, resonated with the, the work that you did here in Gone Reflections um, with you know, this kind, these kinds of abstract um, sound portraits of those sculptures. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you also uh, did a film series called A Grammar for Listening in 2009, um, which was fascinating. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Um, <clears throat> so I was listening to a, a, a lot of field recording at the time, and field recording was becoming a sort of nascent art in its own respect. And, you know, people were practicing field recording as, as an art form and um, phonography and, and um, concerts of field recording, you know, I was going to concerts of field recordings and things like that. Um, so, and meeting field recording artists. And so I basically wanted to make a film about field recording and I chose three or four artists that used field recording as their primary medium. Um, and that was Eric Lacasa um, from Paris, Lee Patterson from, from Manchester, and then this artist from Japan, uh, from Yokohama, uh, Toshio Tsunoda. And um, they all have very different approaches. And so the film, basically I made a film with each person. And uh, the films are kind of like um, conversations or dialogues where we're trying to work out the relationship between sound and image. Um, and where one isn't um, following the other, one isn't like um, subservient to the other. Um, so there's not like a, a director, you know, that, that, that is dominating and, and, and yet it's not also just like using the field recordist as a subject in a film like um, blowout you know, mm -hmm. or, or uh, écouter le ton. Um, so it's, it's not made a documentary about the field recordist, but it's looking at how they, how sound works right. um, and their practice of, um, you know, their predilections, the field recordist predilections and, and philosophy behind their, their sonic practice, and then trying to find a, a correlation in the way that I would film that. Right. Um, so uh, Lee Patterson uses a lot of contact microphones and so he's recording like the implicit sounds within objects. And um, obviously with a camera, you can't record beneath the structure of an object, you yeah. know, unless you have some kind of um, X-ray or something like that mm -hmm. camera <laughs> um, or some sort of thermal dynamic camera or something like that, which I didn't have. <laughs> um, I wasn't interested in having. And he also um, used underwater microphones. Um, so I was interested in, in how to translate some of these ideas yeah. into, a visual, into the visual realm. Right, so that was the, you know, it's, it's, so it's not a straight documentary of these field recording artists. It's, it's your experience of them and translating that experience of them. And it's almost like a collaboration. It's, it's um, yeah, it's a completely co collaborative process. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, there's a you know there's dialogue yeah. going on going on between us um, to the point where one of the things that when we were talking about this with with Lee Parson, one of the things that he said, well, I, actually, I can think of um, one thing that I do that, that sonifies, um, you know, an object, and that yeah. was when he placed an ebo on this instrument that he'd made, and it has these um, springs, small springs attached, and when the springs vibrate. Um, are vibrated by this ebo, which is basically like um, the induction of a magnet um, at two different poles. Um, it, you can see the the waveform, mm. or the oh, wa wow. the the sonic waveform is represented visually. Right, right, right. By the so that was you know an example of like the sort of dialogue that we were having. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, the 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 work that you were. Um, shortlisted for the Turner Prize for uh, All Divided Selves was essentially, a, I mean, um, it, was, it was an artistic rendering of a document, but, a, but also a documentary of the, the um, kind of radical psychologist R.D. Lang uh, from, from your hometown of Glasgow. Um, you know, I'm curious because, um, you know, it seems to be a lot of the, the kind of um, uh, sound artists that you 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 know um, either did documentaries of or or have worked with or uh, known are these kind of fringe figures oftentimes you know not uh, not um, uh, kind of uh, known by the mainstream um, but R D Lang was someone who was a fringe figure who was widely known by the mm -hmm. mainstream Can you t talk a little bit about that that project yeah. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I, it came from a sort of very personal um, perspective in terms of, um, you know, thinking about um, people that were close to me that were distressed and how we treat people that are in, st in emotional states of crisis and um, that it being like this sort of postcode lottery, mm -hmm. you know, depending on where you live, um, <laughs> of what kind of... Uh, quality of care um, you would get. And um, so R.D. Lang was someone that really um, tried to examine the medical model, you know, from a different, from a different viewpoint and um, take, you know, take on board sort of existentialism um, and, uh, you know, existential philosophy into basic and, and sort of communications theory, you know, so people like Gregory Bateson um, and his idea of double bind and, but really just approach the patient as a person. Right. Rather than a set of uh, symptoms, right. you know, that needed to be treated um, uh, with drugs. And so that was what was remarkable about him was that he looked at the social context, but he also humanized, you know, the, the, at that point, um, a medical model that predominantly looked at physical abnormalities, you right. know, um, physical uh, diseases, right. you know, and, try, and curing people of, of that. Yeah. Um, he, he felt that, you know, people were um, thrown, were trying to live through untenable situations in their life. Yeah. And that they were, um, you know, caught in these knots that he, that he so um, vividly describes. Right. Um, yeah. And these contradictions that they they weren't allowed to recognise that they were in a contradiction. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the the all divided selves is like a documentary of documentaries because it it looks at um, it's really like an analysis of the media and how. Lane was represented um, in the 60s and in the 70s and then into the 80s where um, care in the community and Thatcher, Thatcherite politics started to come into play and Lane's theories were really, um, you know, devalued. 
right. and, and him, he, he was sort of villainized as a, as a figure hmm. um, and lost a lot of credibility within um, the, the field. So, so it's kind of, yeah, looking at how he was represented right. and, and how also how mental health, how we, um, how subjective, you know, and, and fashionable um, our ideas about mental health are right. um, in terms of the media. So it looked at these different media portrayals of mental health from when R.D. Ling and David Cooper were prominent figures that were respected to times when, you know, the biochemical and pharmaceutical industries really started to um, take a grip on influencing that field. Right. Yeah. Um, I think we are um, running a little long. Um, why, do, why don't we, well, one of the last things I want to talk about is, you know, you, you are, were described uh, in the introduction as an uh, artist, filmmaker, and musician. And you've been a musician throughout your life um, and have a current musical project um, that, you are, that you're doing um, with um, a number of other musicians, um, which, you, which you call a, a, a more. Mm. A-M-O-R. Is it A-M-O-R or Amor? Like Amor. A, Amor, okay. Yeah. And it includes you and Paul Thompson, who is the drummer for the band Franz Ferdinand, um, Richard Youngs, who was described as an experimental folk musician. Is that right? Is that? <laughs> Sounds what day you catch you. <laughs> <laughs> And then Michael Dutch? Duch. Duch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, sorry. Michael Francis Duch. Yeah. yeah. Um, who plays the, who is a, a renowned double bass player. He's a Norwegian um, experimental bassist that, uh, yeah, plays a lot of um, minimalist music. Yeah. So I, I found one website that described the band as a brand new avant super group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, t t you know, tell me about the process that, of working with these, you know, these three other musicians. I mean, it's very different from um, you know, what, what you've done here at the Nasher, where you're working largely alone or um, experimenting with, with materials here. Um, not too uh, different from your filmmaking, where you are often collaborating with others. Mm -hmm. um, but in, when, you're, when you're creating, you know, what essentially is, is a form of sound art, how, how does this kind of collaboration work? Well, Firstly, it, it works in a sort of social uh, way, where it's a, it's a way of getting out of the, you know, the the solipsism of the studio and uh, <laughs> the, the, the sort of, uh, yeah, the studio is a solitary place of, of working and collaborating with other, other artists who have different areas of expertise and specialism and um, you know, having a conversation about, about you know, a musical conversation um, about how, how we can make something together. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, well, the, the Amor project is, is basically a sort of minimalist uh, disco project <laughs> or a sort of avant, avant disco project. And um, I was influenced by the idea of it was was influenced by a couple of things one one was the idea of the 12 inch as um you know the extended mix of a 12 inch um that you would get in these sort of disco tracks from the from the 70s and so they would 12 be 12 inch vinyl yeah record, yeah, and yeah where you'd have one song on a whole side yeah and it was uh, Generally, it was remixed by DJs. Right. So it was the first time that DJs like Larry Levan or Walter Gibson, uh, Gibbons, sorry, um, would be, um, or Tom Moulton, would be let into this, to the studio right. and just given run of the, the 24 tracks. And ch they, t they tended to loop uh, with tapes d the drum parts yeah. um, so they could mix them. 
and um, quite often times sort of dub out the vocals or like concentrate on um, different uh, musical arrangements of, right. of, of, a, of a more well-known track. Um, but really it was, uh, you know, they were made from the perspective of a DJ for the dance floor. Right. Um, and so I thought that was kind of, you know, I think that is something that has died out with the invention of, or the, um, the, the predomination of computers and music, um, which have completely removed the human playing, you know, um, largely, you know, cause we, we use drum loops and, and, you know, we use synthesized, uh, you know, I Feel Love introduced and Kraftwerk introduced these, you know, synthesized arpeggios and, and you know, soft, software sequencers and things like that. So the, the errors, you know, the, the, um, the nuances in playing are lost. Right. Um, uh, of playing one thing for 12 minutes right. or, or 14 minutes and what happens when you play that you know as a drummer as a bass player right. as a pianist yeah. you know playing a repetitive set of notes or a set of patterns for you know um yeah w what happens in, to that in, in a musical way sort of interests me right yeah so are you, are you all composing in so, in the in the so studio we together play in a room yeah, yeah. and and um it's recorded as a band, and then it's mixed the same way that, you know, well, harking back to these sort of DJ mixes where <coughs> you need to completely deconstruct the track. Right. Um, emphasizing the percussion and the, and the rhythm section. Right. Largely. Yeah, that's great. So thank you very much for not only this work, but for this conversation today. No problem, thank you. And, um, I, I just want to, as we're, we're going out to the reception, uh, wanted to leave us with um, uh, a track by, um, by Luke's new project, Amour. Amour. So we'll have that for you to enjoy. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. What, what track are you going to play? <laughs>